Welcome to our second video about advanced filtering. So let's start by talking about properties. Now, as you probably already know, properties are used to represent columns. But what you might not know is that these properties can also be used in filtering. So let's start by defining what properties are. So basically, it's metadata that does not necessarily have to exist on the wire. So one example of this is SMB file name. An SMB file name is data that doesn't exist in every frame, even though that frame might deal with that particular file. So by using this property, we can do a filter and find the frames that are associated with that file name, even though that data is not in the frame itself. Now this data might also exist in multiple places. For instance, a create will have a file name in one specific data structure, which would have a data field path that you could use to find that one frame. But you might want to find the same file in a get info frame for SMB. So let's use this in, in an example. So in this case, I've transferred a file called m1.wave. So I'm just going to do a contains filter and look for m1 and find all traffic that has that property defined in it. So if we, know, if we look here, you'll see that the file is represented here in this first frame. But in this second frame, even though we list the file in the description of that particular frame, it does not exist in the hex data anywhere. So what we do is in our parsers, we remember the file ID that's associated with that. We save this in a global table. And then when we parse a frame, we populate this property, SMB file name, for every frame that deals with it. So this makes it very convenient for us to look at all this traffic by the file name. So I can see all the creates. And I can see all the various frames that are associated with that file name, even though they're not in the frame. Now another use for properties is that it can represent calculated values. For instance, TCP payload length is a value that does not exist in the frame. When you look at TCP, it does have information about its header size, but in order to calculate the actual payload length, you have to take the IPv4 length and its header size and, and do some calculation to figure that out. So what we've done is we've wrapped that calculation up in a property so that now you can use it as a filter. So for instance, I can find any kind of large payload sizes. And then this query will respond and return all those frames where the payload is larger than 1,000 bytes. Properties can also represent global and conversation state information. A lot of this is used by our parser code, but some of it is also useful to us as users. So one of the typical examples here is TCP retransmits. To tell if you have a TCP retransmit, you must keep track of all the TCP sequence numbers, which our parsers do. And then what we do in our parsers is we create a property called T CP retransmits or retransmit and we set that value to 1 when we've detected that a sequence number has been retransmitted. So by applying this filter you can determine those frames and understand if you have a network problem. Now in my case this is a local copy of my home network and you don't often see retransmits in that environment. Normally what happens is you have a router that is really busy and cannot keep up with the amount of traffic it sees. In fact, maybe you know the memory in the router is not enough to keep track of all the, the various connections it's going. So what it has to do is drop those frames. And when it drops a frame, the other side recognizes this. TCP is smart, and it says, OK, I'm keeping track of these sequence numbers. Haven't seen a response for this. I'm going to resend it again. And that retransmit shows as a duplicate packet, which gets detected in Network Monitor by this property. So there's other metadata that is represented in properties. 
and you've seen some of these before. We've talked about the column names, such as the process name here. This is really just metadata that we collected during our capturing process. It's not part of the frame, not part of the traffic that even goes on the wire. We have to make some special API calls that allow us to read this information and store it in the capture file. So what we do is when we're parsing is we store this in a, a property called process name. And now you can do a filter. And I normally use contains. Anything that has a string in it, I use contains in case there's more in there that I want. For instance, I'm going to do I explore. I don't want to add on the exe because I'm perhaps lazy. And therefore, I can get all those frames dealing with Internet Explorer. Now, there's many types of properties like this. In fact, a lot of them are found in something called frame variable, which we're going to talk about in just a sec. But another one I wanted to point out is the comment title. You can do a filter on any annotations you've added using this frame commenting feature. So if you add a frame comment, you can search on that later. Again, I'll use contains. And now I can locate those comments. So the next question might be, how do you find these properties? Now, like I said, there are many, many of them. In fact, if you look at IntelliSense, the list is incredibly long. The reason is, is that since we do use properties for more than just data we want to display to the user, we don't have any way today to make those useful ones show up and all the ones that are used by our parsers not show up. But what we have done is we will name our properties using the protocol that they're associated with. So if I type in TCP, you see that there's a bunch of properties associated with TCP. And the same goes for SMB and some of the other more common protocols. Another way you can find properties is by looking at the parser code, the NPL. The way to do this, or the most simple way, is look at a frame where you think there might be a property. So for instance, I'm going to look at window. I want to see if there's a property associated with the TCP window size. I'm going to right click the data field, and then I'm going to go to the data field definition. This brings up the source code where that value is actually defined. So you can see here that it's defined, it has a size of a uint, which is how our parser code defines the structure of the raw data. And then if you look right above it, there's often the square bracketed code, which are basically directives where we use to define global properties, conversation properties, and some other things. So in this case, you can see that we have both a property called window size and TCP window size. And without looking too much at the code, you could probably make the assumption that this is a property that represents that window size. And in fact, it's a little bit more complex in the case of window size because the window size is actually a calculation of the original TCP setup where we calculate a scale factor multiplied by the current window size. In some cases that data might not exist, so we can't properly calculate the real window size because we don't have the data, but you can still use this value to do a filter. In this case, we have two of them, and the reason being is originally, historically, we named it window size and realized later that it would be easier to find if we preface it with TCP. So they almost equal that identical value. The only difference is when we display it, we want to display it as a, a, a decimal value. So for instance, now if I wanted to use that, I can say I want to see all window sizes of zeros. Maybe I want to look for a problem where the window size has decreased really small. And in this case, nothing shows up. So the final thing I want to talk about is the frame variable or that I mentioned. Frame variable basically stores a lot of information that's kept in the frame itself. There's a couple of other things we've stuck in there, like the comment title. But some of the important ones 
I want to call out are the frame length and the frame length wire. These represent two different types of values about the actual length of the frame that was sent. So when you create a trace or when you take a trace, you can specify how much of each frame you want to capture. So by doing this, you allow perhaps greater performance or a smaller capture file because you're only interested in the header. So if you've cut it off to 100 and you have a frame that's 1,000 bytes long, the frame length is going to equal 100. The frame length wire will actually show you the real value, 1,000 in that particular example, of the frame as it existed when it was sent. We also have frame number. So you can set a filter on a range of frames. Just keep in mind that this is off by one. So frame one is actually frame zero. So let's go ahead and focus in on time delta. Time delta represents the distance in time between the last physical frame and a trace. Now this is different than what is actually shown in the frame summary if you add the time delta column. The difference being is we do a special calculation when we display the frame summary and we do that based on the last filtered frame. So if you have a filter applied, it actually does the calculation. However, when you create a display filter using time delta, it's always done on the last physical frame. Now the other thing to realize here is that we don't deal, you can't type in 1.0 for one second. Instead, you have to translate it. So for one second, if I wanted to find all frames for one second, I would type in 10 million. And now we'd see a bunch of frames listed. And if I was going to take a specific example, frame 13 must be one second in front of frame 12. Remember, it doesn't take into account filtering at all. So now if I remove my filter and look, you can see here that the distance between frame 13 and 12 in terms of seconds is greater than a second. And that's why frame 13 was returned. The last thing I want to talk about is filtering on time. So often you want to see a trace and you want to say, I want to see all the frames in between two particular times. Now this is not the most straightforward thing to do with Network Monitor, but it can be done. The best way to do this is actually taking a trace and right clicking on the column to do the filter. Now the problem is, is that in Network Monitor 3.4, we show a different time layout than we did if you did a capture in 3.3. And the reason is, is by default in 3.4, we save time zone information so that we can adjust the time you see based on your own time zone. So if there's other log files that are also translated that you can associate those using the same times. But I can still go back to the 3.3 format by selecting it in the column. And as you'll see, it's now changed it back to time of day. So this is the time that the trace was taken relative to the, to the time zone where it was taken. In this case, it's the same. I, I took this trace in my time zone, so it's the same value. But in any case, you can now right-click on this column, add the time of day to the filter, and now you see what that value is represented by this particular frame. Now you might ask, well, what if I just know the times and I don't want to go look up the frames in the frame summary? Well, that is possible. This particular value is just a file time structure that's a standard structure we use. And there are tools that allow you to convert the time of day to this value. So you could use one of those tools to actually calculate this value. And now you can say, OK, I want all the frames that are, so let's change it to say greater than or equal. And now you'll see that it shows every frame from four and beyond based on that time. Well, that's the end of our advanced filtering video number two. So I hope you've enjoyed and learned something.